This video series is proudly sponsored by RS Grassroots Education. You can refer to the Design Spark article link below to find out more materials related to this video. Hey, what is up guys? Welcome back to Chapter 9. From the previous videos until now, we have been talking about solar cells with a single PN junction, called single junction solar cells. The efficiency of single junction solar cells is limited by the Shockley quasar limit due to the trade off between current and voltage. You can check out chapter 5.1 if you don't already know about this limit. Third generation solar cells are defined by its potential to surpass the Shockley quasar limit. One of the ways to do that is by using multi junction solar cells, which is what we are going to talk about in this video. Now, we recall that any electron that is excited higher than the energy band gap will relax down to the edge of the conduction band, losing energy through thermalization during the process, sacrificing the maximum attainable voltage. So, it means that the excitation is most efficient when the band gap matches the photon energy it absorbs. Silicon with a band gap of 1.12 electron volts can only achieve a 100% excitation efficiency when the photon energy it absorbs is 1.12 electron volts as well. Any photon energy higher than that, like 2 electron volts, reduces the efficiency. But since the solar spectrum comes in a wide range of photon energies, we can't have a single band gap that fulfills all photon energies. So the idea is, what if we were to use more than one band gap? What if we have two different solar cells with different band gaps and we let each solar cell absorb a different range of solar spectrum? This concept is what inspired the realization of multi-junction solar cells. In multi-junction cells, we have two cells stacked together a top layer with a higher energy band gap, and a bottom layer with a lower energy band gap. When sunlight enters the top layer, it only absorbs the higher energy photons, and is practically transparent to the photons lower than its band gap. This lower energy photons travels to the bottom layer, and then it is absorbed. This way, we get to reduce voltage loss caused by thermalization of electrons. In fact, the voltage that is produced by the solar cell is the addition of both the voltages of the top and bottom layer, since they are connected in series. Of course, we can distribute the spectral absorption into three or more layers, but in this example, I'm just showing two. Most multi-junction solar cells, at most, have only up to three different absorber layers. Ideally, the efficiency of multi-junction cells surpasses the Shockley quasar limit, and hence, as shown in the NREL solar cell efficiency chart, most of these multi-junction solar cells, marked in green, have over 30% power conversion efficiency. Well, the idea of multi-junction solar cells is fairly simple to conceptualize. The actual implementation is not this straightforward. One of the largest challenges is the material selection. You see, in order to electrically connect the different layers together, we need to ensure that these layers have the same lattice constant, such that the lattice connection at the interface is continuous. Otherwise, a mismatch that is constant will induce strain and defects at the interface of the connecting layers, preventing efficient charge transport. One of the industrial standard multi-junction solar cell is called the 3-5 multi-junction solar cell because its material is made from the combination of group 13 and group 15 elements. 
This multi-junction solar cell consists of three junctions. The top junction is gallium indium phosphide with a band gap of 1.85 electron volts. Middle junction consists of gallium arsenide with a band gap of 1.42 electron volts. And germanium as the bottom junction with 0.67 electron volts band gap. These materials are carefully selected because their lattice constants are similar allowing them to be properly connected electrically. Another area in material selection is to select a material with a suitable energy band gap. Let's start with a very simple example. Say I wish to create a two-junction solar cell. The bottom layer is gallium arsenide with a band gap of 1.42 electron volts. The question is, what is the optimal band gap to be selected for the top layer? Before we dive into this, I wish to introduce a concept called current matching. Let's start by plotting out the IV curve for a multi-junction solar cell. Say for example, the top layer has an IV curve like this, with a short circuit current of negative 13.8 milliamps and open circuit voltage of 1.3 volts. The bottom layer has a short circuit current of about 17 milliamps and open circuit voltage of about 1 volts. The question is, how would the combined multi-junction cell IV curve be? We know that the combined open circuit voltage is simply the addition of both the open circuit voltages of the individual cells, which are 1 and 1.3 volts. So the total would be 2.3 volts. The short circuit current, however, is a little tricky to find out. Now let's zoom into this section. You see, we know that short circuit current happens when open circuit voltage is zero. Hence, it's somewhere along this line. For the open circuit voltage of the multi-junction cell to be zero, the top cell voltage has to cancel out the bottom cell voltage. This can only happen at this point, where the top cell has a voltage of negative 1 volts and the bottom cell has a voltage of 1 volts, effectively cancelling out each other. The IV curve of the multi-junction cell can then be plotted out, with a short circuit current of negative 14 milliamps. This is very close to the short circuit current of the top cell, which is negative 13.8 milliamps. The point I'm trying to prove here is that the short circuit current of a multi-junction solar cell is approximately the lower short circuit current of the individual cells. This is a very important point that will form the foundation of our following discussions. We know that we always want the solar cell to operate at its maximum power point. This requires both cells to be operating at its maximum power point current. But if the short circuit currents of both cells are different, it's a good indication that the maximum power points of both cells are different, and hence one cell is always not operating at its maximum power point. This is why current matching is critical. The need for current matching has profound implications on the design of multi-junction solar cells, especially in determining the optimal band gap of the solar cell. Back to our earlier question, what band gap should be the most optimal for the top layer? We know that the band gap determines the amount of photons absorbed. The amount of photons determines the short circuit current. So if we were to do current matching, the most optimal top layer band gap should be the one that gives the same short circuit current as the bottom cell. This is the entire idea of choosing an optimal band gap. We know that the higher the top subcell band gap, the lower its short circuit current. But because a higher top subcell band gap allows a greater range of light to pass through to the bottom layer, 
the bottom layer short circuit current increases with top layer band gap. There is a point where both the short circuit currents of the top and bottom junctions equal each other. This is where the ideal band gap is to achieve current matching, which is 1.95 electron volts. However, the material with the closest band gap we can find, while still satisfying the lattice constant matching criteria, is gallium indium phosphide, which has a band gap of 1.85 electron volts. The efficiency of this cell is theoretically calculated to be about 30%. However, this means that the currents won't match. Now, there is a trick to match the currents, and that is to control the thickness of the top layer. We know that if the top layer is thin enough, it will come to a point where it won't be able to absorb all the photons above its band gap. Some photons will then be transferred to the bottom layer. As we decrease the thickness of the top cell, the top cell short circuit current decreases while the bottom cell short circuit current increases, eventually intersecting at this point, where the currents match. At this top cell thickness of 0.7 microns, the efficiency has been theoretically calculated to be about 35%, an additional 5% compared to the previous case with an infinitely thick top cell. Here is a summary of what we have learned so far in this chapter. Pause the video as you wish. That's it guys for this chapter on multi-junction solar cells. In the next chapter, we are going to explore the most exciting and research solar cell in the world currently, and that is perovskite solar cells. Take care and goodbye. <music>